Party presidential candidate for 2020, running on the platform of localization. And I'm here to talk to you today about the coronavirus crisis that we find ourselves in the middle of, hoping to provide a voice of reason in this time of hysteria. So thank you for joining us today for what should be a reasoned conversation. Joining us in the studio are our driver, David Clover, and of course, our uh, my fiance, uh, who's with us, Samantha Miller. She is taking notes and is going to be watching your comments and questions and making sure that we are able to address all of the concerns around this crisis. And again, provide some real leadership in looking at this from a calm, responsible perspective. Obviously, it's really important when Democrats and Republicans are going nuts and using this fear to take advantage of you, that as libertarians, we remain cool, calm, collected, and be the adults in the room. So, first of all, the most important part of my message to America today is don't be afraid. Do not allow yourself to be held hostage by fear or by governments. Now, some people have looked at what I've been posting on social media lately, some of the jokes, some of the memes, some of those things that we have made as comments about this to make light of the issue. And of course, this has been met at times with people who are keen to promote the crisis and the fear with comments like, this is no time for humor, people are dying. Well, no, in times of panic, this is the most important time to remain humorous, to keep a sense of levity about things. And even if this were time to be singing, ring around the rosy pocket full of posy, ashes to ashes, we all fall down. No, this is not the black plague, but even if it were, it would be important that we maintain our composure to not allow fear or panic to get the best of us and to not be prone to manipulation. So to the actual rational response to what it should be for this event, and really, it's more or less a non-event. A new type of virus has entered the human biosphere and that we are able to see and identify better than ever before in human history how this is happening and how we can treat it. And what this looks like is a form of the flu. And I know this is almost becoming cliche and people say, well, what about the uncertainties? What about what we don't know? What about if it mutates? Well, what it looks like is we may have a new category of flu. Um, you know, we've got flu A, flu B. We have what is a very unfortunately ineffective system at dealing with this, largely because of government intervention in the healthcare industry with pharmaceutical companies and all of the ways that we are manipulated by the system that good information is kept from us and prevents us, therefore, from making fully informed decisions. We see around the coronavirus outbreak more than ever the problems with trusting government with dealing with such crises. We are more than capable of this as a species, humanity, as a community, as a global human family of coming together and saying we can deal with this rationally. Government's involvement so far has only slowed things down and made panic more common. So we see with the reality of the bug itself, at least what we know with this disease, is that it is extremely contagious, much like the cold or the flu, although there are diseases out there that are more contagious that have been successfully dealt with throughout human history. So to the contagiousness of this outbreak, what is the implication for policy and what a rational response should be? Well. Odds are, if you're out and about, you're gonna get exposed. In fact, there's a good chance you've already been exposed. And as we have seen from the reports just of individuals who have dealt with this, for most people, it's no big deal. They either get it as extremely mild symptoms or don't even notice it. And this is one of the important things that we take into account in determining what should a rational response be. Because clearly, more people have been infected than have been reported as infected. I don't know if you've noticed, but wherever they get test kits out, they have a lot more cases. And I'm not saying, hey, maybe test kits are the cause, 
But if you're big on throwing science to the side in favor of fear-mongering, you might be inclined to that particular logical fallacy of saying, well, gee, where there are test kits, there are cases. We better get rid of those test kits. Maybe that's causing the coronavirus outbreak. Obviously, that's ridiculous. But if you just look rationally at how few people are getting tested compared to how widespread this obviously already is in some ways, there are way more people who have it and have been exposed than have been tested or are being reported as positive cases. Now, to the death rate, because this is what government uses to scare us. It is obviously relatively low, even by the worst reported standards. But if you looked at flu death rates by comparison, just in the United States in the 2000 2017-2018 flu season, 61,000 Americans died. Way more than even the greatest projections for what we're seeing with coronavirus. And the thing about the flu, as we have dealt with it in the past, is that it kills children. It has a rate of death that is not based on your current state of health. You could be perfectly healthy and it would still kill you. With coronavirus, what we see is a much more consistent bias towards killing old people. People who are on death's door already, people who have a limited uh, ability to fight back any kind of disease, people who you could attribute their death to relatively minor health incidents that would push them over the edge. And this gets to the next part of what I would have suggested for a rational response, were the attention turned to me last Friday instead of our liar-in-chief, Donald Trump, who has actually ordered that CDC deliberations be conducted in secret. This should be maddeningly offensive to anyone with half a brain, seeing that we trust our lives to people who are going to make these decisions without allowing us to make informed decisions for ourselves. So there may be, and it is possible, that there is a unique risk here. We have, at best, a new flu strain in our library of diseases that we do not fully understand. There may be greater risks associated with it. And for people who are immunocompromised or elderly to be able to make a rational decision about social distancing or isolation or staying home, they need to be fully informed. And in order for those quarantines, those self-quarantines, to be effective, the rest of society can't be quarantining ourselves and freaking out. To whatever extent there is a legitimate threat or legitimate concern here, it is dealt best not with violating individual rights, not with the violent responses of the state or giving government more power, but making sure that we stay capable of supporting those who need it the most. One of my great fears in what we are seeing now is that the effect of the virus itself will be much worse in terms of the death toll, which again, will be relatively insignificant compared to so many other threats that humanity is facing. I'm not overly concerned with that, but that the death toll is going to be made worse by this panic. That the people who need our help in isolation, who should be isolated, nursing homes, elderly care facilities, people in those types of situations, hospitals, being overrun and not able to take care of people who really need it, that's the threat. In this case, the government cure is far worse than the disease. And again, for a little bit of perspective, if you know anything about me, you know that one of my pet issues is veteran military suicides. 22 a day, also a very underreported number. If you say, hey, Adam, you can't laugh at this. Well, have you stopped laughing since you found out about that and decided to do something about it? Not only is a rational reasoned response from someone who can be calm uh, really important in a time like this, but so is a little perspective. Not just on the other current threats that we are facing as a species, but also historically to recognize that it is times like these where government overblows fears in order to take on more power, to take advantage of you. The most important thing we can do now is ridicule this panic and say, this is really dumb, really, really dumb. 
And it's silly to let them scare you into giving them more power, to giving up your rights. That's what's really going on here. Yes, we need to fight this. Yes, we need to have a rational response to the coronavirus. But the most important thing that we fight is fear. I know it's cliche, but you have to say it again in times like these. Churchill's great line, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Now, if only that were true, we actually have a government to be very afraid of taking advantage of that fear, and it is already doing this on a massive scale. I don't want to say historically unprecedented, but certainly for the thinness of their excuse, the heavy-handedness of the response is insanely out of proportion. We have states shutting down schools now for eight-week periods. We have in New York City, restaurants and bars completely shut down. I believe here where we are coming to you from Detroit, Michigan, that the government of the state of Detroit has ordered no gatherings over 250 people and schools are shut down for four weeks here. Now, the problem with this, and we have heard uh, various efforts online of people saying, hey, we really need to be careful. Yes, don't panic, but we want to flatten the curve, right? That if we do nothing, and this virus is allowed to run its course through American society, that there's gonna be a peak in this curve, and that that might lead to an overwhelming of the medical system. That if instead we take just appropriate precautions, we can level that curve, spread it out, even if all of these people are going to be infected over time, if it's truly that viral, then let's make sure that it's spread out and we don't end up overwhelming the healthcare system makes absolute sense. But in order for that strategy to work, flattening the curve has to make sure that it is done in a way that doesn't impede our overall capabilities in the economy to provide basic life-saving medical processes, support for the medical industry, basic human needs, food, water, clothing, medical, so all of that, if we can maintain our abilities there, then yes, within that, let's do everything we can to flatten the curve. So in my personal situation, I'm 38, I'm perfectly healthy, and I know that I am at the lowest risk of anything by any metric within the uh, coronavirus death spectrum range. And this is, again, so silly. If you just took a, a chart of you know what ages people die at in general from natural or biological causes it would it would look something like the curve that we're seeing for the coronavirus death chart so yeah I, if, if it's out there and there's a chance that I could spread it to someone I'm gonna make sure I'm washing my hands I'm gonna make sure that I'm staying extra healthy that I'm getting enough sleep that I'm eating right that I'm exercising just being a little more strict with my self-care routine. And I think, hey, if the coronavirus crisis serves as a reminder for everybody to be a little healthier, that's great. Part of the problem is now they're shutting down gyms. I'm a big fan of Anytime Fitness. We travel all over the country going from gym to gym to gym, and now they're shutting down my gyms. I am not gonna be happy about that. And a lot of people are gonna be less healthy as a result of this and this is what really concerns me in the fallout from even perhaps a flattened curve one of the things we know about the contagiousness of this virus and again there are many that are more deadly and more contagious already out there in the world but if you are contagious with coronavirus for and now we have seen studies that have shown already you can be contagious for up to 37 days you can recatch it well, then all of these shutdowns are absolutely useless. In fact, they are counterproductive because what are they going to do? Shut down the schools now for four weeks and then eight weeks? And then what? Well, it's still going to be out there. This is not going to solve the problem. Are we going to say, well, we're at the flat part of the curve, so send the kids back to school and let them get sick now? No, this is absurd. This is a hyped response by government that is going to do more harm than good. And it is imperative as Americans who care 
about the well-being of our fellow Americans, that we do everything possible to calm the hysteria, flatten the curve of fear, and make sure that we maintain our heads and our capabilities of actually taking care of each other. The economic fallout from Trump's state of emergency is going to be with us much longer than this immediate threat from the coronavirus. We are going to be suffering economically as a result of trusting government in a crisis like this. More people are going to die as a result of economic hardship. More children are going to go to bed hungry tonight because of this. More people are going to be out of work, incapable of paying their rent, their bills. The economic fallout from this is going to be massive and with us for a very long time. What Trump has shown is a massive failure in leadership by failing to come out with a consistent reasoned response and failing to show complete transparency in how the federal government is covering this. So the lack of transparency that we've seen from all governments handling this so far, of course, first with the Chinese government and now the United States government, inevitably makes things worse. When people are unable to make fully informed decisions, there's uncertainty. That uncertainty in itself feeds into the fear and the panic. So what is one of the other responses that we see from government here that is especially bothersome and should tell you something about why they're doing this, why they're overhyping this, why they're scaring people into accepting whatever response. And by the way, we're going to get into this later. I'm glad that we have uh, Samantha with us in the room and, and Samantha is going to read uh, a list of some of the highlights of, of, of news stories that you're not getting because everybody's freaking out about the coronavirus. And I hate to admit it myself that I have spent so much time reading news stories about this, seeing contradicting information over the last few days, when this should be something that we can brush off like no big deal. Well, when you're not paying attention to what the right hand is doing because the left hand is scaring you with coronavirus stuff, the right hand's gonna get away with some pretty wicked shit. And we're gonna get into those stories at least briefly today as well to make sure you know what you've been missing. One of the biggest ones is that in response to the economic crisis around coronavirus, which has largely been created by government, government has to, excuse me, the Federal Reserve has to pump $1.5 trillion of liquidity into the system. Yeah. Whatever the crisis, you know part of government's response is going to be give the banks lots and lots of money. Hmm. Wonder why? Yeah, this is part of the obvious ripoff. So it is true that in a event such as this, a, 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 what I would categorize as a relatively minor or what should be a minor bio crisis is now turned into a significant economic, logistical, political crisis. So in times of such crises, such relatively small bio crises, yes, it is important that we have mechanisms in society of redirecting resources to meet those needs. What government has done and what they always do by creating money from a central point and distributing, distributing it to the friends of government who are going to do what government wants to do with it is they create a misallocation of resources. That's another thing that scares me about this response is that we are going to see resources go into the hands of the friends of government, the corrupt special interests, pharmaceutical companies, and of course the banksters instead of going where it needs to go. A non-violent solution to this, the libertarian solution, the solution based in freedom is based in love, respect, and cooperation voluntarily as opposed to through the coercion, force, violence, threats, and authority of government. So a brief note before we get to your questions on the philosophical understanding of this from a libertarian perspective. As someone who believes in self-ownership, the non-aggression principle, basic human ethics, in a situation like this, a lot of people will take some existential threat from the virus and say that this is an excuse using rationalization, faulty logic, logical fallacies to now violate your rights as an individual and say that you must be quarantined by force to say we are going to keep you in your home or prevent you from traveling in some way. All of this violates basic 
ethics. You have a right to freedom of movement, as long as you're not hurting anybody else and saying that you might have something on you as a virus, doesn't give another person a right to violate your freedom. You have a freedom of association, freedom of movement. You also have freedom of disassociation and isolation. If you want to stay home, you have a right to stay home. You have a right to self-quarantine. You have a right to isolate yourself. You do not have a right to force somebody else to do that. You do not have a right. President Trump, the government of the United States, does not have a right to say you cannot travel, that you cannot use this means of transportation, that because you might do something, because something might happen, we are going to do something that violates your rights, that hurts people, that reduces quality of life. And it is in times like these, it is all the more important that we stay true to our moral principles. The political implications of this are hugely significant. And uh, some of us who want to see more youth participation in politics might be gloating that all the boomers are going to be staying home this November if the crisis is with us that long. But obviously, that is not an answer based on the love and respect behind our message. We want everyone to be safe and to be able to participate in the political process. With the Libertarian Party, we see state conventions being canceled and going virtual across the country. My schedule, my team's schedule for the next couple months leading into the Libertarian National Convention is pretty well up in the air right now. We hosted a little event in Detroit last night to say that we are not afraid to have a little Corona party. And I was actually very disappointed to see that even among uh, our fan base of Libertarians, people are significantly scared into some kind of reaction based on how government wants you to behave in the face of this crisis. Uh, I, I will not be slowing down one bit. Of course, I have to live in reality and in wanting to talk to the American people, to American voters. We're going to be meeting you where you are, wherever you are willing to come out, if it's on the internet, if we're going to be doing these every day from now on till the end of the election, uh, Facebook live streams, then We'll do whatever it takes, excuse me, to keep getting this message out there. So before we go to your questions, just one more thing, a little bit about uh, the numbers with the perspective here. In Italy, it was reported that they have 24,000 cases as of today and 1,800 deaths. And if we assume that the um, rate of infection is 100 times what they have tested, then the death rate is much, much lower than the flu. If it's only 10 times, it would still be lower than most of the threats that we see from the flu. So even in the places where the fear mongering is the worst, and again, with these numbers, it's very hard to trust. And even as a libertarian, as a skeptic of government, when we see conflicting information, when we see information that we know is misreported, in China, there was even a point a few weeks ago where they decided we're going to use a different counting and reporting method for cases and deaths. And there was a sudden spike, and then it went back down. You go, wait a second, wait a second. How can you do what well, we were counting those as cases, and, and now we're not? And that they're not transparent about this makes it all the worse. Even for myself as a skeptic, I have to look at this and, and really do some second guessing of what I'm being told. I have to do some questions, I have to look behind the numbers, and as a good skeptic, see what the real threat is. But obviously, it is not enough for us to be reacting out of fear. So, um, Samantha and, and David, do we have any questions from the live stream or, or points that I missed that, that, that we need to cover before getting into questions and all the news stories that people have missed as a result of the corona crisis? Uh, no, the most frequent question was, who do you trust to provide accurate information on this, though? Who do I trust? That is a very good question. Uh, it, 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 I do believe that the politicians who end up serving as mouthpieces for the various institutions that are actually doing statistical tracking and looking at this like the CDC are going to distort things. So anytime I hear a politician saying something, I'm going to go to look to their source. And when I look to their source, I'm going to question that, too. And when it's the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, 
unfortunately, this is a this is well, this is a great institution. Lots of wonderful, talented, intelligent people who go to work for the CDC because they want to help the American people. Unfortunately, because they're paid by government, are subject to the orders of President Trump. And when Trump says, do your deliberations in secret, who knows, could he also be ordering them to distort data, to distort information? It's definitely likely that we're not getting straight information there either. So I do believe that of what's out there, there are more distortions than outright lies and exaggerations. And so what I do is I, I look at all the various sources. I understand that mainstream media outlets in the United States have certain standards of credibility that they want to maintain. So they're not gonna make things up completely out of the blue, but they will go with exaggerations. Remember, this is the mainstream media that lied us into the war in Iraq. Of course, they can lie us into a crisis around the coronavirus so that we can be more easily taken advantage of by government. So I can't say, you know, Sam, I, I wish to, to, to the people who are asking us, what is a reliable source of information? It is one of the unfortunate realities of a crisis like this occurring in a government-dominated world that we live in, where we can't get reliable information on things like this, that we can't say it's just this or it's just that. Now, if anybody wants to comment with suggestions on where they're getting reliable information and they have ideas that we could share with others, then I would be happy to repeat that on the broadcast and encourage other people. But most importantly, we should be looking to each other. We should be looking to our communities for strength. We should be looking to people around us, checking in with each other. It's very easy when you're doing research on this, when you're looking at the headlines. And by the way, I will say, uh, DrudgeReport.com has been a great aggregator news site, and it's one of the ones that I use the most. I also use uh, Twitter and Facebook, people who send me things, uh, social media comments, responses to things on Twitter. If you tag me in something, odds are I will see it personally. And uh, again, from, from aggregating all of these for myself, I'm able to come up with a, 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 what is, a, a, to, for my uh, satisfaction, a reasonably complete picture of what's going on. But for people who don't have the time or the experience wading through mainstream media silliness, then it, it, I think it's especially important when you could be getting a very distorted view if you only looked at one media outlet, if you didn't look at anybody who was questioning that narrative, that perhaps you would uh, you know, give yourself a distorted image of what's happening. And in that case, it is very important that as a sort of reality check, uh, in, in times of, of, of crises and threats that you look to your neighbors, we look to each other, our families, our friends, our communities, and that we be all the more connected in order to handle the uncertainty. I would also recommend naturalnews.com, Mike Adams' website, as a great resource for true science-based reporting on things like this. And uh, I, I, you know, I wish I had more time and prep for this today. I would have spent some time at naturalnews.com, but I would bet money that he's got some great reporting on this and some better statistical analysis and perspective for people who really want to uh, get, get the numbers uh, in, in an understandable way in their heads. So what's next, Sam? Um, how do you feel about the medical and pandemic experts recommending the same thing that the government is recommending, experts not driven by political candidacy? Right, I think there's a great tendency when those experts are funded by government to mirror the government narrative. I think from just as many health experts, we have seen recommendations of go about your life, just wash your hands a little bit more often and be careful if you're concerned. And when we see, you know, Sam, I, I, that question references the current medical authorities. Well, let's talk about who they are for a second and how credible they are. Current medical authorities are the ones who have echoed government sentiments that cannabis has no legitimate medical value and been responsible for countless, countless deaths as a result, especially among the seizure, seizure children whose seizure conditions are largely cured by CBD. These are the people who have lied us into the opioid crisis, who shove pharmaceuticals down our throats. These are the people who are responsible for us having this crisis of veteran suicide. So when, I, when, when you say, 
Well, the medical experts are saying what government is saying. I would say, which experts? And what are the experts who gave us the straight dope on these recent issues there where they contradicted government? I would rather turn to those experts who have proven themselves trustworthy over the experts who have proven themselves to be servants of authority rather than the people. Next question, please. How does the non-aggression principle apply to not infecting other people? How does the non-aggression principle apply to not affecting other people? That's a great question. For people who don't understand first, the non-aggression principle is the libertarian foundation from ethics, excuse me, for ethics, that comes from this idea of self-ownership. If I own myself, you would be violating my self-ownership to assault me, to take my life, to imprison me, to take my freedom, to take my property. And this non-aggression principle is very important in maintaining our bearing in this because it is tempting to think that, well, if I'm infecting someone else, that I am somehow violating the non-aggression principle. Well, that's only the case if the contact itself is non-consensual. And this is what it comes down to, consent. Do you consent to that contact? Now, if social norms shift as a result of this crisis, I'm a big hugger. You know, we go to libertarian events, there's a lot of love, and, and, and you know, we go and there's a lot of hugging and, 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 and just, you know, being affectionate and, and showing that love. And I'm always very careful. I don't, I don't, you know, hug people by surprise. Consensual hugs only here. And it's the same thing today. If, if, if we up our game and say, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to stick my hand out because some people have a, you know, a, a knee jerk response and they grab your hand when, when you put it out because that's what we're conditioned to believe is polite. You know, maybe you want to go out and say, uh, well, are you shaking hands or would you rather fist bump or elbow bump or, or whatever the case may be to minimize your exposure. But it is certainly not a violation of the non-aggression principle when it is commonly understood that, you know, people pick their noses and wipe their butts with their hands and then they go shake hands with other people. Yes, Sam is uh, horrified at my silly joke here. But this is, this is truly, this is, this is a really important feature that you have to go, hold on, don't be afraid. This is kind of how, how it already works. You already know when you shake a stranger's hand on the street that you could be exposed to whatever they have. You are consenting to that exposure. So if you want to withdraw that consent, I wholeheartedly support you doing that before, during, and after the corona crisis. Uh, I, I'd like to think for, for being a you know, a politician or an activist who goes out and shakes hands all over the country all the time. I'm a bit of a germaphobe. I try not to touch my face after shaking hands. Uh, you know, when, when I grab a doorknob to a bathroom or a handle, you know, I might use my pinky and just, just barely touch it. Uh, I'm pretty good about, you know, personal hygiene and, and, and staying up on, on all of that. And if someone is sick, you know, I, I, I take appropriate precautions to, to not lick doorknobs in their house. And I, I think just, just doing those things, you see, that is an assertion of your freedom of disassociation. And it is out of respect for the non-aggression principle that, uh, that, that I would say we have to maintain that basic ethical standard that we've had in the past where if someone wants to disassociate, they absolutely have that right. And uh, saying that because you might be a carrier uh, of something, and by the way, something that is, again, in, in the realm of all of the diseases out there, a relatively insignificant threat, although a somewhat new one, a somewhat not yet fully understood one, uh, that, that, that we not really uh, you know, change this. If it, if it results in society re-examining what are our standards of social contact consent, uh, if, if perhaps it just makes it more acceptable for people to walk around wearing a, a dust mask or or gloves or whatever the case may be as is appropriate for them hey I'm all for that increase in consciousness and people being more aware of their own health how would localization help in this situation how would localization help in this situation that's a great question well the most important thing that we see government doing in screwing this up is restricting the free flow of information because we have allowed it to become an organization with lack of transparency. And it's hard to, is, is that worse than shutdowns? Well, shutdowns and everything else may be getting worse as of right now, as, as, as I speak, we see those uh, accelerating across the country. 
Um, but the most important thing in localization is that it gets government transparent and it allows us to have real quarantines when that's necessary. Now think about it this way. What if coronavirus really was bad enough to justify large scale quarantines? What if it was really bad enough to justify a town saying, hey, we're going virtual, anybody outside city limits, we're blocking off. Well, you can't do that when the only mechanism of shutting down travel is this giant nation state that we have today under the federal government. So this goes to the immigration question as well, right? How would you limit, uh, you know, if you want to be able to live in a place where borders are closed, uh, and, and I, I don't believe in open borders versus closed borders as, as a paradigm. The only legitimate borders are private property borders, are borders that are created by legitimate property claims and are created by communities voluntarily. When a government puts up a giant line on a map and says we own or control everything within this, that's not legitimate. So if you got government local enough to where you had legitimate borders at the community and individual level that were enforceable, you could have realistic large-scale quarantines when justified, when warranted, when people can do that voluntarily. You would also have a much more responsive and flexible medical system. Instead of waiting for the federal government to redirect funds, to rewrite laws, communities, individual hospitals, healthcare providers will be able to respond as appropriate based on the real threat and the resources they have available in their communities. You have a much uh, a more light footprint that, uh, for, for institutions that are able to respond much more flexibly, much more rapidly in a situation that would require such a response. And I think the coronavirus response, whatever is justified here, obviously it's way overblown, but we should take a lesson from this. That government in charge of healthcare, in charge of the CDC, in charge of all of these resources that we would use to address such a health threat makes us less safe. Seriously, listen up America, pay attention to what's going on. This crisis should be an awakening moment for everyone to realize that the government system we have now makes us less safe because it is a centralized, coercive, authoritative system and that transitioning to a localized, cooperative, voluntary system would be better in every way imaginable. So I mean, I, we could keep going on this and examine all the different ways that localization, again, you know, makes government more transparable, transparent, more accountable to the people, uh, that, that we have more goods and services, that we have more medical supplies, we have better ability to respond in a flexible manner to health crises, we have actual effective ways uh, of doing quarantine when government is localized. But we could, I, you know, I could talk for another hour just about all the ways that localization makes so many other economic, social things better that w would allow us to have a better response to such a crisis. And um, you know, maybe we'll, we'll keep talking about those in, in future broadcasts. Um, but for now, uh, if, if we don't have any other major questions, Sam, do you mind reading me that list of uh, the stories that have not been uh, given due reporting as a result of the coronavirus crisis overwhelming the airwaves. And, and the first one that, that, that I want to point to here is that uh, the, the United States military is escalating in Iraq again. There was in, an incident mm -hmm. last week in which uh, I believe it was two American service members and one British service member was killed uh, in Iraq. And as a result, the US military is increasing airstrikes in Iraq uh, allegedly, and again, do you trust the government to tell you the truth in a situation like this? Of course not. Uh, this is, you know, watch what the right hand is doing so you don't see what the left hand is doing kind of thing. And it is, it is really offensive that the government of the United States, President Trump, you can sit there in the White House and say, this is a national state of emergency, we need to shut things down. Oh, but all that empire stuff that we're doing in the Middle East? No, 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 don't slow that down at all. Keep killing innocent brown people on the other side of the world. Keep running up the bill through the military industrial complex. Keep giving us an excuse to rip off the American people while we develop this new coronavirus racket that allows us to print another trillion and a half dollars to give to our friends and increase government powers. I'm 
reminded of, as always in, 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 in times like this, and I, I can't say it enough, that scene from V for Vendetta. You remember when things are going nuts and Chancellor Sutler is in front of his cabinet on the giant TV screen and says, Make them remember why they need us. That's what this is all about. Be afraid. Rally around the leader. Absolute nonsense. Don't be afraid. The government mantra here is don't let a good crisis go to waste. And to them, that means taking on more power, exploiting you more. And again, the economic fallout that we're seeing, the manipulation from this, is going to be with us for a long time. The more we can do to get back to normalcy, to go about our lives without fear, to keep doing business, keep taking care of each other, the stronger we will be and the less they will be able to take advantage of us. What was the next story there, Sam? I also want to mention the Iranian embargo. There's coronavirus there too. Right, so we see this used as an excuse to limit trade in so many other ways, and as has been pointed out by numerous pundits, this is not just the coronavirus, this is the Wuhan virus. Don't forget where it came, don't forget to give them credit here, Trump trying to make this. Yes. Uh, and I, I don't wanna, I'm not gonna jump to racism. There is an undertone of that here, of course, but of nationalism, which is, if you were born within the borders that my government set up around me, you're a better person than people who were born outside of those borders. And that is absolute nonsense. We cannot let the government use the fears around coronavirus to stoke nationalism, which is really anti-people who aren't part of our nation. And it is so dangerous to see that, that these barriers, these psychological barriers could be raised. And maybe, uh, you know, there's a, a blunting effect of the fact that the virus's next hotspot after China was Italy, so that, hey, now it's in European countries too. Well, it's harder to be racist against Italians than it is against Chinese people. Uh, but that doesn't stop the trumpeteers from calling this the Wuhan virus and trying to uh, associate it with China and making sure that they are blamed for it. Which gets to one other point here uh, on the origin of this. We've seen uh, a variety of conspiracy theories that this was a product of the United States military industrial complex perhaps, or that it was from a, a weapons lab in China. But regardless, it is with us, and because government controls all of the ways that information gets out in such a crisis, or at least a lot of them, uh, we may not know the truth about the origin for quite some time. So what's the next story we've Speaking got here? Speaking of Europe, um, a second person was cured of HIV in the UK. Yes, we are on the verge of globally curing HIV. Go team people. What a beautiful thing to celebrate. Look at where we are. Something that has claimed the deaths of far more people than the coronavirus has, we have now defeated it. And that story is being buried. A story of hope and progress and medical technology being applied to improve the human condition. No, that story is buried so that you can be afraid. What's next, Sam? Congress is attempting to pass a law that will effectively end end-to-end -end encryption on communication platforms. Yes, so Congress is working to limit your ability to communicate with your fellow Americans while preventing the government and others who would from spying on you and violating your privacy in those communications. No surprise. I don't think this is the first time Congress has tried to do such a thing, it's not. but they are more likely to get away with it when they don't have the obvious pushback and accountability. And this is just a basic mechanism of how the system works in America, that when governments are, or when, our, when, when Congress is trying to uh, pass something that, that might be unpopular, anti-freedom legislation, if people get together and call their congressman and say, please don't vote for this, oftentimes that is successful in defeating such tyrannical efforts because those congressmen know now that if they go back to their districts and try to get reelected, there are enough people there who know they are voting against this. Now, without that scrutiny on Congress, this isn't that conspiratorial, this is just how the system works. 
without that check on congressional power, they're able to get away with more, they come home to their districts to get reelected. We all know that the system greatly favors incumbents getting reelected, but now even more so they're able to do wicked things without their constituents getting the same awareness that they would otherwise because we're all distracted by the coronavirus. Uh, I think we, we, we need a better term for this. Maybe we should ask people in the comments. I, I've been calling it coronavirus season as a way of, you know, kind of humorously decontextualizing it as a crisis, that it's more like flu season, right. um, something, something that will come and go or perhaps come back seasonally. We don't know. Although uh, I have seen some optimistic reports that high temperatures are very good for killing the virus and that it'll have a similar uh, life cycle if it becomes something that stays with us, like H1N1 that's just out there that... There's, there's a flu season, and then it goes down in, in warmer months. Um, so, what's, so if someone wants, if someone in the chat, if you're, if you're watching this on, on Facebook Live, or, or even uh, later on our YouTube channel, or, or on any other outlet, again, please share this if you can. Uh, we need to get this information out there, this perspective out there, so that people can calm the fuck down already, because shit's getting ridiculous. This is, uh, really, it's just silly at this point. Voices of leadership, cooler heads need to prevail to say, look, we're the adults in the room, calm down, this is getting silly. So please, share this, and if not sharing this video in particular, share that message however you can to get out to your community, people around you, so that we can minimize the harm of the corona crisis. What, now, see, we need a better term. I want something to make fun of this. Do this really, what, what you know... That, 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 we, that we can just do a term to, to diffuse this whole thing and say this is this is just absolute silliness and the response is going to hurt us uh, more than, than the disease itself. Maybe the, the corona fear crisis, coronaphobia, maybe that's a coronaphobia, the coronaphobia crisis. Is it, we have you got some good terms there in the comments, Sam. Uh, Gus put the propaganda plague. The propaganda plague, I like that. Yeah, the corona yeah. propaganda plague perhaps. Yeah. What else? Nothing? Uh, nothing. I'm really no good kidding. terms? All right. Um, speaking of illnesses, dengue fever cases are going up and being overlooked, and it's in the Florida Keys. <sighs> Why is it? Now, I, I mean, I wonder. Maybe there's something particular about the way that this, uh, the, the coronavirus started and spread, the way that we saw people in China and Wuhan freaking out about it. We saw the uncertainty and fear around how the Chinese government was hiding this. But yeah, dang fever. We have another uh, disease that is probably more of a threat than coronavirus, but doesn't have the sensationalist features. And, and maybe it's just two things. This thing is extremely viral. No, no question there. You've got a good chance of having already been exposed is just an American going about their daily lives. And I, and I want to point out that, again, like I joked about, the, the, where, where is coronavirus worst? Well, it's where they have the most test kits. Yeah, no kidding. So if, if that's the case, what we have is a lag in the numbers. Whatever they're telling you today are the number of, of positive test cases. The deaths, I would bet, are pretty close to current. But in terms of cases, it's probably following a one-week leg. And what we saw from the growth in China, there is a kind of exponential growth phase in this and then a leveling off. Although I don't know how much we can trust the leveling off numbers in China or if it's just that it's gotten out in a way where you don't see the deaths or perhaps the Chinese government has decided to make it look that way. And this, this is another great danger of the current system of allowing governments to exist in other places. And I would cite Martin Luther King Jr. An injustice anywhere is an injustice everywhere. As a libertarian, a limitation or an infringement on freedom anywhere means that we all live in a less vibrant world as a result. And as a result of the Chinese people allowing the Communist Party to have taken over their country, we really can't trust the information coming out of China. It could be that this entire curve that they're portraying is based on some other accounting gimmick or some other different method of reporting cases or testing. Or maybe they ran out of test kits, and that's why testable cases are going now, obviously. There's so much more to this, and anybody who wants to do their research should, but most importantly, don't be afraid. Spread courage. All right, what's, what's the next story? 
Something really cool is a new dinosaur the size of a hummingbird was found. How about that? A new dinosaur the size of a hummingbird. I saw the story. The skull of a new dinosaur found preserved in amber. Pretty exciting thing that we could be talking about and all the ways that humans are getting better at science and history and understanding the world around us and instead we're worried about toilet paper. One of my favorite jokes uh, that I've seen re-memed several times around the corona, what, what are we calling it now? Cor propaganda plague. Propaganda plague. Uh, <laughs> oh, coronaphobia, whatever it is. That, um, geez, where, where was the, the terminology? Like, oh, the joke about toilet paper was that uh, as as we waded through the bodies of dead Americans and wreckage everywhere in the wake of the corona crisis, we found one common theme, immaculately clean buttholes. <laughs> really? That's, that's what we're worried about? That, that, I, th this should be embarrassing to the American people that, hey, coronavirus came, some people might have actually been threatened by this, and what did we do? We hoarded toilet paper. What's the next story, Sam? Russian parliament passed a reform allowing Putin to stay president until 2036. Yeah. Scary, scary stuff there in Russia that a man like Vladimir Putin, who once was my boss, technically, remember, when I, was, when I had a TV show on, on Russia Today, yeah, that he is able to get that kind of power. I think this represents a major step backwards for human progress and decentralization of power. It's all the more important that the Libertarian Party of Russia have a voice, and I think if the American people and people around the world who support decentralization of power and authority uh, would be looking for opportunities in Russia to fight this uh, you know, strange legal glitch of Putin's history and power in Russia, where now he is consolidated to the point you said they are going to let him stay in power till 2036. 36. Yeah. Wow. Four more years. Now, four more terms. That's 16 more years for Putin. Yeah. Um, and an asteroid, This it's supposed to be larger than the Eiffel Tower, is about to fly right by Earth. Barely so missing us now. Do we, do we know for certain that this is going to be a near miss with the asteroid? It, it's it will be missing Earth, but if it were to hit, it would cause massive destruction. Right. It won't be, but okay. it'll be passing. Is there any chance that it might affect weather or gravitational patterns? Is it going to be that close? Nothing I've read so far, but we'll have more information ready for the next Adam vs. the Man podcast. Wouldn't it be nice if I had more than a passing few seconds to discuss this actual imminent threat to all life on Earth, <laughs> rather than talking about the coronavirus and reading about it for hours on end? Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff happening out there. A lot of evil stuff happening we would be better off addressing. you got a couple more stories for us, right, Sam? Some big ones that, that we've missed as a result of this. Uh, Harvey Weinstein was yes. found guilty. And Har the, the justice system, uh, while the wheels of justice grind very slowly in America, sometimes they do go towards justice, although I think the bigger lesson here is again wow i'm quoting mlk again justice delayed or justice deferred is justice denied and what the me too movement has illuminated is that we don't have adequate protections in the system for victims of sexual assault and and uh, ways of protecting society from people like harvey weinstein and i don't want to pretend to weigh in as any kind of expert on that case but clearly him going to jail now at this point after allegedly being a victimizer for so long, mm -hmm. if that's the case, is a gross miscarriage of justice. We can and must do better. And while we were distracted by the coronavirus, we missed that one little footnote to history and all of the potentially positive lessons that could come out of that. Anything else? The plague of locusts tearing through Africa. Yes, and this is something that is a real crisis that will kill probably a lot more people because it's going to lead to widespread starvation. There yes. are going to be people in Africa who are unable to feed themselves crops that aren't going to be harvested properly, that are just going to be decimated by a plague of locusts. There's an actual biblical scale plague happening in Africa right now, and America is freaking out because we have a new kind of flu. Anything else on, on the uh, list of hot stories that we missed this past week, Sam? Hmm, there's so many, actually. 
Should we go back to questions then? How, what, what time is it? How far along are we? Uh, we're about 50 minutes in. So 50 the one minutes. I will close with is that at 12:30 today, it was reported five earthquakes in 15 hours rattled the Carolinas and Tennessee. Wow, I hadn't even heard that one. Yep. And it makes you wonder then. So well, excuse me. It happened today. Today, today, a wave of earthquakes on the eastern seaboard, and I just have to shake my head. And it is uh, the real tragedy of uh, the corona, the, the, the propaganda crisis here, that to the things that are happening in the world today where people need real help, we are less capable of responding as a result. And that's the tragedy here. So again, don't be afraid. Be brave. Spread courage. Be the adult in the room when everyone else is losing their cool. Sam, I do want to wrap up here in, in about an hour's time for, for the broadcast as a whole. So if people watching have any last minute questions, this is the time to get them in. Sam is watching questions uh, on, on her phone for this feed. So, um, so many other questions. This is a, a very complicated issue. You know, people are afraid of lots of various contingencies uh, in, in this, uh, and, and to some degree, rightly so. The greatest thing we have to fear here is the government response. And I hope that uh, as libertarians, that we have an opportunity, that we fully take advantage of it here, to be the adults in the room, to remain calm, cool, and collected, to set an example for the rest of the American public, to show some real leadership here, and, and also to uh, direct, redirect the, the fear out there to a legitimate source for it, which is a government that is completely out of control and will do whatever it can to take advantage of a crisis like this in order to consolidate power in itself. So any, any last questions for us today, Sam, before we wrap up? Uh, we have one that just came in from Carl. Carl asked, how did North Korea pull off a 100% death rate and a total of zero infections? That sounds like a reporting glitch. I must have missed. South Korea is reporting... North Korea. Excuse me, North Korea. 100% death rate, but... Well, gee. I do think North Korea might win the prize for least transparent government in the world. They're <laughs> certainly up there. Do you really want to trust numbers coming out of North that And this is one place where I would say you really can't trust any of the numbers coming out of, of North Korea. And it's sad, again, uh, that, that we have allowed uh, our fellow human beings to be victims of a government like the government of North Korea. And as much as I have praised Trump for going out and shaking hands with Kim Jong-un and uh, you know dancing merrily across the DMZ hand in hand, what he has done did not fundamentally shift the power structure in North Korea. And if we were able to get the government out of the picture, the American people, the most generous bloc in the world, would be able to address and help the problem with the government of North Korea with uh, propaganda aid, with true uh, foreign aid from individual to individual, helping people in need there, and, and helping people overthrow that system for themselves, unfortunately. Uh, when Trump says, I'm president, and I'm going to make sure this president of another country, he, what's his official title? Is it emperor for life? Great leader? Something like whatever it is. He's, we're going to make him a kinder, gentler tyrant. He's still, Trump is still reinforcing the idea that countries should have a, a singular monolithic leadership that is forced on the entire country. And if anything, that has made it harder for the people of North Korea to progress past this, although I de generally support his efforts at peace and reconciliation between the governments of North Korea and the United States so that there might be less likelihood of violence that would affect innocent people, but obviously we're capable of much better. And again, if we really step back with a little perspective to learn the lessons of the current uh, coronaphobia crisis, then we will see that having more government always makes things worse. 100% uh, death rate and zero infections, yeah, the government of North Korea, unsurprisingly, is once again full of shit. Any, uh, any other burning questions from the audience? I know we're getting uh, 
chip shots from the cheap seats as always thank you so much for joining us everyone today for being a part of this much more reasoned discussion than anything we see out of the mainstream media looking at the coronaphobia crisis the propaganda pandemic the fear mongering that's going on is just it is it is silly it is ridiculous literally subject to appropriate ridicule let's make fun of this thing let's keep our heads let's uh you know take advantage of the situation so that people get the lessons from it and if there's nothing else sam i'm just going to wrap up and say again thank you so much for joining us if you want to email me please send me a line at adam at thefreedomline.com thefreedomline.com is our main website you can find kokishforpresident.com from there without having to remember how to spell my funny last name although i imagine wherever you're watching this you will see some links and tags obviously if you're watching this live on facebook right now please follow me friend me whatever it is on facebook and on twitter and join our email list it has been pointed out numerous times that I have the most shadow banned channel on YouTube. So you might want to subscribe there and have me kept out of your feed as well. And I think given the social media control over the conversation, it's important to take this note as a reminder that we be active seekers of information, not passive recipients. Don't accept your Facebook feed telling you the truth. I recommend everyone seek out the truth for themselves. Uh, just as two sites as a reminder for recommendations, drudgereport.com has been a great aggregator of news through this crisis. You still have to read between the lines as most of their sources are mainstream media. And of course, naturalnews.com. Stay tuned here on my social media, facebook.com slash Adam Charles Kokesh, on Twitter, at Adam Kokesh, Instagram, at Adam Kokesh. We will keep you up to date on everything we have going on with this campaign. I should say one other thing we forgot to really get into was the implications for the Libertarian Party National Convention, which is coming up May 21 through 25, where the Libertarian nominees for president and vice president will be selected by a thousand delegates who show up there, along with our next national chair, vice chair, and Libertarian National Committee Board of Directors. So for people who want to participate in that, be ready, be prepared, and be prepared for something unusual to happen. I would hope that uh, while this is happening in Austin, where the mayor has declared that all gatherings over 250 are now illegal, who canceled South by Southwest, a major film and music gathering that happens there annually, which is going to result in a very difficult financial economic year for everybody there in the service and hospitality industry. My heart goes out to all of you, the real victims of this crisis, who are going to lose your jobs, not being able to pay rent or take care of your families as a result of this. You are the real victims of this crisis. The government spreading fear is hurting you directly. They are scaring people away from supporting you financially in your honest businesses. You are the victims, and I hope it is all the more important that people like you stand up in this time of crises. When we have uh, people forced to stay home, uh, I hope that that time now is well spent in waking yourselves up, waking others up, spreading counter-propaganda, spreading a libertarian message of love and truth and respect for your fellow human beings. So uh, it's really important that you seek out information for yourselves and you help others do the same. If you know people in your life who are elderly or immunocompromised, make sure they know what the risks are and they are able to make an informed decision to self-quarantine or practice whatever appropriate social distancing they decide for themselves. And with that, I guess, am I forgetting anything else? David, all good. David, oh, we have two Davids in the room here today. Um, if that's everything, I will just say thank you so much for joining us today. Please be a part of the solution, not the problem. Spread love, not fear. And finally, peace and love, y'all.